Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. My name is Maggie Vandenberg with the IQ Business Group. I'm happy to be your moderator for today's webinar, From Cradle to Grave, Managing the Information Lifecycle. I'm joined today by Ryan Britton, Vice President of Delivery from Mint, and Brian Vanetten, Solution Engineering Manager from Avpoint. We are proud to sponsor today's webinar to support our public and private sector folks, including Fed, SLED, and our private sector friends seeking knowledge and insight for leveraging Microsoft 365 to implement a successful information management program from data creation to data deletion. For folks who have joined us before, thanks for joining us again. And for those we haven't had the pleasure of meeting before, welcome. IQBG is a leading provider of records and information management solutions for the public sector and highly regulated industries. Since 2008, the IQ Business Group has been developing ECRM and content services solutions for highly regulated industries, including public and private sectors that leverage people, process, and technology to support your requirements. Thank you, Maggie, and hey, everybody. Um, what a wonderful topic we have today, uh, information life cycle from cradle to grave. Given the time of year, I almost feel we need a slide for what happens when information comes back from the grave. I'm Ryan Britton. I work for the Mint Group, which is a global Microsoft partner specializing in implementations in uh, highly regulated industries uh, as well as governments. Uh, we are, have a long list of gold competencies and we've been a Microsoft partner for 20 years. We are active in five different territories um, and we're pleased to, to be the M365 uh, consulting experts on the call. Brian? Hmm. Brian seems to be having some technical difficulties, but Avpoint enables organizations to collaborate with confidence as the largest provider of Microsoft 365. Hello. Oh, there he is. Hi, there Brian. Apologies. Uh, so I'll try that again. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Brian Benetton, and I'm the manager of the solutions engineering team for North America based in Seattle. And I've been working at Appoint for now for six years. But just like Mint Group, Appoint has been in the Microsoft and SharePoint and M365 space since uh, since its founding back over 20 years ago. So we help we help customers manage, migrate, and backup their uh, M365 and SharePoint content. And we also have specializations in content management, both at the enterprise level and for organizations who are, for example, going through an M&A or having to deal with compliance frameworks such as SOX or, or other legal frameworks around the world. We are also a global company. Thank you. Right. Uh, I almost felt like Brian had to come back from the grave there as well. I'm right. glad he managed to, <laughs> to get it right. Um, the intersection of the three companies that is represented here uh, this afternoon is uh, a, a value proposition called Smart Compliance. It's been built up over the last five or so years uh, and is essentially a a uh, conjoined effort from a global global Microsoft implementer, a, a uh, ECRM expert with 20 years of experience and one of the top tier uh, ISVs for the Microsoft uh, ecosystem. So all of the, the best of breed providing uh, a combined solution for you uh, in the form of smart compliance. And, and we come to you from that expertise in order to, to deliver tonight's message. Okay, next slide, Maggie. Okay, this is just a, an overview of what the Smart Compliance Framework contains. It has been developed in the trenches over, as I said, the last five years or so. Um, and there's a lot that goes into this, uh, but essentially there's a transformative information governance and compliance uh, program uh, that organizations use in order to implement some of the more difficult uh, and transformative um, information requirements uh, in today's uh, today's world. We're going to be talking about some of those those problems uh, on tonight's uh, call, today's call. We're going to start things off with our first poll question. We just want to get a sense of where you are in sorting out your information lifecycle management pro program. 
So that should be up on your screens now. So with most people having voted, 18% say no, they don't know what that is or how to manage data. 20% say no, but they are planning to implement one. 13% say no, but they are working on implementing one. 31% say partially, but they need assistance in creating a more robust program. And 16% say yes, they have an effective system in place. Okay, so straight into the meat and potatoes of today's topic. Um, I want to start by talking about the changing face of the information ecosystem. For folks who've been involved in managing uh, information systems or uh, administering information, uh, you would know that there's quite a lot going on in, in the world right now in terms of the systems that are generally involved in that process, where historically, uh, collaboration and records management systems were completely different systems. You had compliance officers and records managers who managed a system of retention, and then you had collaboration systems such as Microsoft SharePoint, which would allow folks to develop um, content. And at a point in time, the content would move from one to the other. At the same time, we're seeing a huge uptake in teamwork systems. These chat applications and meeting applications were something completely different. Uh, and now in this new information landscape, we're seeing records management systems and collaboration systems and teamwork systems all in, uh, be involved in the same life cycle at the same time. And at the same time, we know that organizations are moving to the public cloud, whereas in the past we had largely on-premise environments that we could ring fence, perhaps even in the same building. Uh, these types of environments are much more complex, uh, especially now that we have uh, remote working uh, as an additional uh, variable into that equation. And finally, security and identity, which was something that you would have as completely separate. Perhaps you would have a username and password for the records management system and one for your chat application and one for the collaboration system. Now you use the same identity to log into everything. And so this new information landscape is quite different from what we have been used to five years ago or 10 years ago. Yeah, and things are just moving faster, right? That's the other interesting yeah. challenge here too, that we're seeing such an exponential growth. I mean, we saw this on premises with so many customers, but we're seeing even faster growth of content and consolidation in cloud services. And then at the same time, still a requirement to handle some legacy systems as well. So the balance is how do we focus on both while things are rapidly changing and the demands of end users are growing for better, faster, more secure, secure forms of collaboration as well. Exactly. I mean, I think the amount of information in the world has doubled in the last seven years. So the need That's to incredible. have a, a, a cradle to grave life cycle management system is, is really front and center right now. And just to, to continue on from that uh, concept, what we're seeing is that organizations are building solutions that address identity and security or teamwork or content or governance and compliance in isolation still. So yes. even though we're, we have this newly forming landscape, uh, a partner may come in and move your identity to the cloud and another one may come and activate teams for you and another one may come and build your SharePoint intranet. Another one may be implementing your records management system. But the fact of the matter is that all of these systems are very tightly interlinked. And you can see in some organizations with a very heavy um, focus on identity or security that it's very difficult to be productive from a teamwork perspective. Or in other organizations where teamwork has really been unlocked for the organization, it's difficult to retrospectively apply identity and security or governance and compliance. And so really what you want to do is in the intersection that you see in this Venn diagram, that's a knife's edge where you try to walk a path where you're able to supply friction-free productivity without ever compromising your identity or security or your governance and compliance.
Right, and we also recognize here too, Ryan, you and I were talking about this over, over time, that different parts of the organization also move at different speeds, but these yeah. things absolutely need to be considered for everybody step by step as we as the organization grows into these collaboration platforms or even what the responsibilities are for these co for the content over time or even as the organization changes right new business lines added new features or solutions offered to customers all of these things need to be taken into account like you said and they fall very closely on it on that nice edge when it comes to the compatibility and usability for end users and then how IT administrators can actually go about deploying that strategy exactly and there are different owners, right? The the yes. owner of identity and security is likely different from governance and compliance. Okay, so when we're talking about uh, the life cycle from cradle to grave, it may seem as we start to describe things that you might think to yourself, are these guys actually suggesting that we go and identify individual types of information that we have inside of the organization and build out life cycles for all of these? Um, and uh, this is something that, that uh, Brian and I have knocked backwards and forwards quite a lot. I think we can accept that, the, that doing that would be something that would be quite ridiculous. No organization is going to do that. One thing we do know, though, from uh, statistical analysis over time is that 12% on average of a business's uh, data is business critical. And the rest of it is what they call rot, which is redundant, obsolete, and trivial, or otherwise dark data that isn't really being measured and sits uh, on the network and on people's laptops. Um, and so <clears throat> what organizations have done historically is to say, well, we have to protect the entire iceberg. And so they go to a lot of expense and storage to store and to protect the entire iceberg, even the rot and even the dark data. Um, and at the same time, they're using the same measures to pr to protect rot, for instance, as they are using to protect their business critical data, simply because they can't tell the difference between their intellectual property, which is a Word document, and the lunch menu, which is also a Word document. And so what we're really talking about is focusing on, on the right uh, valued information at the right time. Right, and tied with that too, Ryan, is, and you brought this up earlier, that people just sort of ring fence all of their data when we have to start having this tougher conversation with the business about what information is valuable, right? Yeah. Because as you alluded to with the example of the lunch menu versus a legal document or another contract or another valuable piece of information, how do we find that balance between getting a, a, a line of business to understand its responsibility for its content and help us surface what is valuable versus what can be justifiably deleted over over a reasonable period of time because we see that same issue with the foot massive footprint growth in 365 and other collaboration platforms is that that structure that discipline is still missing hence why you brought up that we just sort of ring fence everything and hold on to it because fundamentally we don't know but we're seeing this with legal frameworks like GDPR, CCPA, among so many others, that not knowing is, is no longer a reason to just ring fence things and move on. So we'll talk more about this later, but just wanted to emphasize those points. Yes, exactly. And the first step on that journey, as we can see here, is just identifying what is business critical, what is rot, and what is dark data. If you can get through to that stage, you've already started to bucket things in a way that makes them much more manageable. Yes. So tying into that comes it comes it comes down to well we really want to focus on that item level structure right that those folders those content those individual files where we know sensitive information lies but you know I don't as an as an IT administrator I typically don't know all that much about the individual items unless I go to someone in legal to HR or to the project management team and say tell me what's valuable here and so that's a that's a way a lot of our customers initially start thinking about uh, about controlling their content. And I'll say that that's not really a, an ideal approach because of how fragmented that information is. So instead, most IT administrators and, I, and IT business owners should really be thinking about this from a higher level. Start controlling things instead at the, app, at the operational level. And by operational, I mean things like the applications or the workspaces where this content exists and start thinking about controlling 
those containers from there. And as you can see on this slide, we're talking about things both in a major divide here between operational governance and data governance, right? So how do we go about getting our users to provision the right workspaces over its lifetime and enforce the policies we want as we govern these pieces, but then start targeting those item levels as well, because now that we know, for example, all the finance documents are in this particular workspace, now we can talk about more complex and more targeted controls like labels, like tags, like, like Azure Information Protection or, or uh, retention settings on content all the way down to the item level because we know where this information is. So looking at this slide from left to right, you know, getting, getting it right at the workspace level is crucial to being able to help target the, the items at the item level as well. Yeah, and I suppose you could see this as almost a division between what you would historically see as as uh, the IT view of of governance and then the information workers view of governance. Is, is yes. that accurate? Yeah. Yes, that that that's a great way to think about it as well, Ryan. Okay, and so ultimately this is the document life cycle that is is the nirvana this is is where you would want to get to if you had the time and money to do this to every type of document in your organization uh, each document type has a life cycle um, and there are critical stages inside of that which would you would want to understand how is it created who is doing the authoring process and what does that authoring process look like how is it virgined is it enriched with additional information that would enable automated workflows how is it shared is there an approval process for this type of document um, how is it published at what point does it need to be archived what are the retention obligations that we have in terms of regulatory uh, compliance for this type of document and finally what does the disposition life cycle look like for deleting this document and looking at this, you may be thinking to yourself, well, I can't really do this for every type of document in my entire organization. Um, and the analogy that I would use to try and describe that is, you know, businesses uh, invest time and expense in measuring things of different importance. So in the finance, we want to know where every single dime in our entire business goes. We have petty cash journals, and it's really important that we can track every single transaction that happens there. But we wouldn't go and attach RFIDs to all of our office pens and track them so that we know where every single office pen that we have purchased as part of a stationary budget uh, ends up, as much as some people would like to know where they all go. Um, and I think that information is at both ends of that spectrum. Some information is like office pens, and you don't really want to manage it at the individual item level. But other information is as valuable to your organization as money. And in those cases, you really want to be able to track them to the item level. And the real trick, the secret source, is being able to identify and differentiate between those two things. And also, you don't need to do this for every single document type. Uh, if I can give an example, uh, we're working with a procurement uh, business unit currently who do bids. Um, and they really only have two types of documents. They have working documents that they, they generate while, while the bid is in process. And then they have executed contracts at the end of that bid process that they have an obligation to retain and they have to put them into a records management system. And there's a very specific workflow for that. Those two types of documents are sufficient Efficient for you to go and figure out um, these workflows for or these life cycles for because it then enables you to say well for our working documents at a point in time when the bid is closed we want those working documents to be archived in a place where we can reuse them for content over a period of one year but the executed contract we want to go directly into a records management workflow where it is retained according to our record schedule for a period of 10 years or whatever the case may be and really this is this is the the, the meat and potatoes of where you you really want to to understand uh, the individual stages of life cycles of documents that are really important to you because if you're not asking the question what is my obligation in terms of retention from a compliance perspective for this type of document, then how will you develop a workflow for that in this new information landscape where everything has collided? Likewise, for things like sharing, if you're not saying who needs access to this and why do they need access and how long do they need access and what does the process of giving them access look like, um, then the information grows organically and it gets shared when it is needed without considering those things. 
Well, Ryan, there was a lot there that you covered that was really awesome. And I want to go back and hit on a couple things that you just brought up, right? Because this exact flow is what a lot of people, a lot of businesses that we speak with struggle with understanding at a really fine level. Fundamentally, most documents go through this cycle in one form or another, whether it is from a particularly sensitive part of the business or just somebody creating something for general sharing as a part of their team, right? And to emphasize some of the points that you just brought up, you know, not everything needs to go through or be thought about in this process but for the things that you guys as an organization think our business critical or talking to the, IC, the the stakeholders of that line of business who want to focus on those particular aspects this is a great way and a great process to help them think through what steps and checkpoints do I need to also have my users go through or the line of business owners the managers out there who are responsible for this content thinking about these things in these various steps right and as Ryan also alluded to just a moment ago this is not something something that's just going to happen immediately out the gate. These are things you're going to want to consider targeting for different parts of your business that contain that business critical information. Only you and your and your stakeholders are going to be able to help define what that is or your interpretation of the legal frameworks you guys are trying to comply with. So think about that when it comes to that, when it comes to the, the strategy of being able to apply this in a reasonable manner, because what we find to go back to that slide that was brought up a moment ago is that there's so much data out there, it's all encompassing, whereas this will help you start chewing through the bits by bit of what you what you want to focus on from a from a from a from a content standpoint so a lot there to unpack and we'll do some more in some following slides but this was a lot of really good information here to listen to and what you just brought up ryan yeah exactly and a good point there related to what you were just saying is that in in many cases um you know it has to design the policies which will govern this life cycle but they're not <laughs> empowered to understand this life cycle you really need those business unit owners to be empowered to the point where they can design this life cycle and then have it apply the policies and we often find that it is settled with the the responsibility of of putting together these life cycles and obviously they they can only do that in broad brush strokes uh, in terms of their understanding of that operational governance that we saw on a previous slide that's right Okay, so if you start to build out these types of uh, information life cycles, you'll need a way to organize them. And the most organic way that that seems to happen uh, is developing hierarchies of information. Uh, these are important because they, first of all, categorize things in such a way that folks can understand where they uh, fall within the organization and more importantly, who owns them, as in these, are, these document types and their life cycles are uh, policy types and they are owned by the legal department because they are all legal documents. And so the process of building these types of informational taxonomies is worthwhile because it makes the entire ecosystem much more manageable. Right. And tying with what you just said there, Ryan, this is actually a really great roadmap for a lot of organizations struggling with where to start. Start with the parts of the business that already have these, these structures or these processes in mind. And as you have on the screen here, some great starting points for you to engage in this conversation with the, the line of business applications and those responsible for them. Finance, the legal department. HR, operations, anything that involves some technical nuance or ones where we have to comply with rules or regulations from outside of the business, these are great places for you guys to start this journey or even build upon what's currently happening out there organically because accountants, attorneys, HR, HR people all understand that they have these, these elements to comply with out of the box, but working with them and engaging these conversations can help build better strategies going forward for how you guys are trying to enable IT services and then applying them at a practical level for your end users. And so those are really good departments to start with. Yeah, that's a really great point. And in many cases, if you just go and dig up your um, organization's record schedule, you'll find that a lot of these uh, buckets of documents actually exist in the record series there. And that's also a good place to start because there's already an obligation to manage those documents in a specific way according to that record schedule.
All right, so let's talk about bridging this gap. And I really like this slide and I included it in our conversation today because like we were talking about and we started at a very high level and we're now starting to get into some of that nitty gritty with both the strategic and tactical approach here. We recognize, as Ryan alluded to in, in our earlier conversation, that the IT team or those who own a line of business application are typically not end users. And as we see on this uh, in this little graphic here, you have people quite literally standing on two different sides of, of cliffs here and they, then they struggle to understand each other from that far away because of their their point of view and what they're trying to enable is sustain for the business so business users and this is no surprise to anybody on the call are just trying to get things done and typically they they have lots of tasks and a lot of priorities that are local to them or their team whereas whereas those line of business application managers are trying to ensure the sustainable use of their of their applications that they're sponsoring or using or being able to even leverage them at all to help meet a particular business goal. That's where we, when you guys, as as you go through your, your different strategy discussions, should consider, is this an automated process? Is this something that we can do ourselves? Or should we look to third-party applications to help fill in some of these gaps? Because even Microsoft says that they develop their platform for an 80-20 framework. 80% 80 of, of what they provide is out-of-the-box functionality. But for that extra 20%, rely on partners, uh, consultants, and, and and strategic and strategic organizations to help build build in those places where organizations still find some needs uh, to be filled for for complying with these particular frameworks so what we suggest here too and this actually comes down to as you can see at the bottom four different steps when it comes to content management so up front a lot of organizations try have tried this in many different flavors the classification and taxonomy scheme you know how should we go about labeling and thinking about our, our documents and to refer back to the slide we had a moment ago talking to those those uh those business units you know your legal your hr your finance departments they can really help you co focus on what works well for them and even and even if they have a particularly complex way of approaching things we can also look at simplifying this as well so that way it can apply to the rest of the business and then thinking about those rules like what ryan brought up earlier what can we start talking about disposing of because not all content is necessarily valuable after a certain period of time and in fact and i believe this statistic is true that most documents after a year i want to say more than 90 percent aren't accessed ever again after that one year time frame uh, from creation use and then consumption and then you know how do we go about enforcing or having that auditing reporting to justify disposition that's really where some reports or oversight can really help with an application like what we're referring to but we also recognize too and this is a slight slight wind change here even though we're talking about digital items we recognize a lot of organizations have physical items that they also have to comply these rules with as well so how do we go about having one source of truth for all of this and a lot of that comes down to a third-party application like a record solution or or an add-on solution to something that, that that Microsoft already does today or another another collaboration platform to help control the workspaces you guys guys are leveraging today yeah and as you were talking you know something that occurred to me uh, uh, oftentimes I think folks see the word records managers and they think well this doesn't apply to me unless I'm I'm in oh, sure. you know, federal state or local or I'm in a highly regulated industry and I think that 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 has changed significantly over the last few years as uh, information regulation has become more draconian I think most yes. most territories now have a PII uh, 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 legislation uh, that makes it incumbent for all organizations to really have retention of personal records and effective information management in terms of uh, you know customers employees partners etc and so really records management in whatever form it takes in all it needs to be a, a discipline in all organizations I think in this day and age and what you're getting at there too, Ryan, just to add on top of that, we also recognize that not all organizations of every size has a dedicated department to this, right? Yeah. That maybe they don't they don't have the resources quite yet for example, for a compliance manager or somebody to be in charge of data privacy, you know, from the get go. In fact, I can say this from some of my previous lines of work, I wore many hats in, in these organizations, similar to what you mentioned, like a records manager at the same time being an IT administrator, at the same time being a solutions advocate internally for business applications. So many of these hats can be worn by the same person. So if you say, well, we don't have a compliance department, well, congrats, you might actually be a part of it directly or indirectly. And so that's what we're really talking about here is those different responsibilities for different application managers. Yep. 
someone once said to me, the, the benefit of wearing many hats is the amount of shade you get. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> okay, we can go ahead and keep going. So let's talk about where to go from here, right? Because obviously we've opened up a proverbial can of worms here with complexity and challenges, and we know every organization of all stripes are, are seeing these things. What we say though, is to really keep things simple for everyone. Technology is, is intended to help. It's not there to dictate your process. So thinking about how to meet and advocate for a solution with your different business application owners can be really crucial here. Because as alluded to earlier in that previous slide, end users really don't want to be records managers up front. They're just trying to get their day job done. And all of these other tags and add-ons are just an extra task and a delay from, from letting me do my day job. So thinking about how to keep that simple as possible is super crucial but then tied to that as we said records managers isn't just a formal role it's, it's something that any application administrator is now responsible for these days thinking about how to actually take the tactical of tagging content and being responsible for it and being able to apply that wholesale to a business process and then finally time is all together to um, to the last last slide here if you want to click one more thank you being able to actually tie in that you know most records most records administrators are not experts either at app at all of the applications that that their business users use and so they're looking to actually just drive a simple process of holding on to data for seven years or however however long they need to based on the type of content that it is but getting those signals from end users is a crucial crucial tag or crucial component of what we want to tie here together because these things need to work in concert to be successful but like we said start simple and start with these conversations with the different parts of the business that already have this in mind and you'll be surprised how quickly this can grow yeah and i think a good point here is that if you if you have identified business critical information and you have uh, worked with a particular business unit to develop the life cycles of the information that are important to them you can design the workspaces in such a way that as folks are going about their day-to-day -day jobs uh, they're placing documents in specific libraries and it's being moved to another place and in the process of doing that it's automatically being classified automatically mm -hmm. being tagged having critical metadata added and so you can really make it quite productive and efficient uh, for both sides of the coin to be fulfilled as they go about their business okay next slide maggie okay right go, you, go ahead Ryan no 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 you you go ahead I think, uh, oh, I think sure you, you may have more to say here oh sure absolutely so starting up front with with any organization when it comes to understanding what's out there as as we alluded to with that slide earlier with uh with that iceberg you know knowing not knowing or security by obscurity is gone especially with the information management regulations that are coming into play globally so being able to help you understand what's out there is super crucial with with uh getting a grasp on what the situation is today so being able to either scan the content or find reports and identifying the cr business critical data this is something that should should definitely be started by all businesses today in understanding the different aspects of where things are today because even though we talked about, for example, every, a lot of organizations are, are cloud first today, every, almost for every organization that is cloud first, I know of one or, or two uh, that also need to take care of legacy systems that, that, that they're still stuck with today. So talking about how we can find that information, what is pertinent and how to move it to the cloud or to another more effective collaboration platform is important. Because tying to that next is how do we move this, right? Do we need a tool? Should we move it to an authoritative source like SharePoint? Is it meant for long-term holding does it need does it need a physical presence someplace being able to get it into a, a an actual scalable platform is the next crucial step here because tying to that next is how do we go about governing it right so an application like SharePoint or m365 is a lot more flexible than something like a file share or another property like that to help drive business processes around lifecycle management of that content or that workspace 
And then tying to that, and the last step here is that records management, right? So this maturity model, consolidation, finding out what this information is, being able to tie in a business process to it, and then finally bringing it to records disposition is really what we're talking about here when it comes to that wholesale strategy of, of these steps involved with cradle to grave content management. So thinking about this today and where you guys are in your organizational strategies, talking to the different lines of business and how they're doing this today is a super crucial um, component of starting this conversation and getting all the parts of the business to align this way so that way it becomes a regular part of the process and data doesn't just sit still and become a security risk or we lack context for it and we have compliance issues later. This part of the conversation should be endemic to all of our conversations with the different departments you guys are involved with. Okay, hey, and now we have a poll asking you, what is your biggest challenge? Where do you most need assistance? So that is up on your screens now. Go ahead and answer that. All right, with most people having voted, the clear winner is lack of stakeholder support or funding. That's at 40%. At 13% is we don't know where to start. At 20% is we lack the skills and experience to implement a program. At 7% is we don't know how to measure the size of the problem. And another 20% is I'm not sure we have a problem. Oh, interesting, thank you. Yeah, certainly an, an interesting set of responses there. Um, and what this slide is about is throwing a spanner in the works, because up to now we've been talking about the portions of the Venn diagram that we saw a few slides back that had to do with uh, compliance and governance and had to do with uh, content creation and collaboration. And essentially we've discussed a life cycle that spans those two things. And then we've spoken about how you want to apply security and identity across that entire life cycle. But there is a, a new child on the block, and that is, that is teams and teamwork. Um, and essentially, this is a very productive way for, for folks to work. It's about creating teams very easily um, and then using those teams workspaces to uh, use chat and meetings and uh, co-authoring and a whole uh, slew of, of very uh, efficient and, and productive features uh, to collaborate very rapidly on documents. And the problem with that is that the team workspaces contain information and that that is going to influence your document life cycles because you may have a piece of information that moves between three different teams during its life cycle or you might have a particular type of team that represents a project and at the end of that project you want to be able to delete the team um, or perhaps archive it or retain it uh, and in the process of doing that there may be some documents that go into a records management system but there may be some information that you want to put into a centralized location so that you can reuse it for new teams that come about and so whereas you may have had a a huge folder structure on a file share somewhere as we start to use these cloud-based workspaces that teams uh, offer us which are are a great way of working we also need to be cognizant of the fact that their life cycles which invo involve onboarding and creation and provisioning of the team and sharing information from within that team which now has a membership which may influence the security of the document all of these types of things need to be governed with very specific policies that take into account both the life cycle of the team and the life cycle of the document. Yeah, definitely. And just to add a little more, more to this as well, um, <clears throat> especially with converged services like M365, a lot of different applications that were historically siloed on premises all now communicate with each other. 
right? So now we're creating yeah. new silos for information. We're creating new con converged spaces of information that historically never talked to one another. Email, <clears throat> excuse me, SharePoint, OneDrive all play into Microsoft Teams, and a lot of and a lot of customers don't fully understand or fully recognize that these things all communicate with each other and create content, right? So thinking about new ways of controlling these workspaces going forward is going to be super crucial to any any record strategy going forward. Yeah, and we've seen organizations that have activated Teams and are you know, for remote working as a result of the pandemic and 18 months down the line, they're now sitting with nearly a thousand teams and some poor person who's responsible for compliance going, well, how do I figure out what information is sitting in all of these hundreds of teams and how do I bring it back to some kind of sensibility that will allow me to meet uh, my obligations in terms of these information regulations that are becoming so stringent across the globe? Very much so. So tying all that together though, and this alludes to what Ryan was just talking about in this previous slide, but then even, even further back a couple slides ago, how do we go about tying these aspects together in a cohesive strategy that's going to make sense for our business? So up front, you know, when it comes to workspace proliferation, especially in a workload like M365 or any other workload for that matter, it's very user centric. And the, the gear is to let users just create something, collaborate and quickly move on. Well, that's nice, but that obviously creates a lot of sprawl and a lot of that Wild West mentality for where our content actually resides. And that could be a serious challenge. So what we say is start governing that up front, scope users into the right self-service management model for your business and a allow them to demand things and receive things on demand, but maybe not leave everything wide open with no context. So being able to drive users to that self-service management here is very crucial because up front, as Ryan alluded to early in the conversation, we can control naming convention, we can control the template they leverage, we can control the permissions by scoping those services up front. And then tying that in the middle here, the ongoing management, this is where the real challenge comes in. How do we go about enforcing the policies over the life cycle of a workspace? If a circumstance changes and the purpose of this workspace changes, what do we do about that? How do we inform the business? How do we inform IT administrators? Or even if there's turnover with this particular project or workspace, how do we go about ensuring the relevant business owners are a part of this? Or even in the circumstance, people get excited, they create a workspace 180 days down the road or however long your business wants to keep an eye on this. How do we go about ensuring you know, that this workspace is still a viable workspace with, rel with valuable content? Because you know, solutions like Delve or even the findability of content and, and, and other platforms can make it very difficult if you've got hundreds of unused workspaces out there. How do we go about enforcing that? Or even the configuration management underpinning this. Thinking, for example, how easy it is to share with external users at the box with workloads like M365. That's great, but it's also a big challenge for security and permissions. How do we go about enforcing those on a regular cadence with the business to ensure in context that users have the right access to the content that they need? And then finally, the last pillar here, what do we do about actually closing these things out? This is the real challenge every organization struggles with because if you ask an end user, all my information is valuable. And this is where I have to press and say, is it really? What about things from a year ago, seven years ago, 15 years ago? You might need it, but does that mean it needs to be necessarily present and available up front? The answer to that obviously is no. How do we go about moving content to a better location for long-term holding? How do we go about retrieving that information? How do we go about segmenting between what is valuable to the business and it isn't really comes down to relying on that second piece, having the users in charge of it, or if they are not, being able to drive a justifiable process to bring things to a closure, hold on to the data that is relevant, and then delete the rest because maybe the structure is no longer relevant, but the content is. How do we go about doing that? And then it all ties together with, with a good governance strategy going forward. Yeah, exactly. And if I if I can check what you're saying with an example, um, yes. So the way I would see it is if I worked at the training at a training department for a large organization, uh, and someone had worked with me previously to design a team that would be suited specifically for training, then um, I could go to a team center and choose or request that a training team be created for me. And the work would have been done to understand, right, 
these types of teams, we have a few tracks per year that we, we need to uh, develop these teams for. We know that there's a three-month period during which the course uh, is outlined. At the end of that, we want to move it into some centralized location for, uh, you know, uh, uh, reuse or for reference which might last for two years and then we're going to either get rid of it or it's going to become a, a record for a period of time. That type of foresight and planning in designing a team that has all of the right types of policies applied uh, and and uh, in place is not only good for me as a, as a records manager uh, in that I'm being compliant and I'm being due diligent with my information. But as the person requesting that type of team, it's fantastic because it's efficient, it's productive, I get what I want quickly. Um, and really, I, I feel a sense of ownership because I helped to design that team. Very much so. And just to add on top of that, Ryan, right, th th this, what we're talking about here is intended to be in concert with your business users, right, or your stakeholders yeah. for the different line of businesses that we're talking about, right, yeah. that these things should not just be imposed, it should be a conversation, it should be a back and forth that helps build out the best the best uh, system for how users want to work because the more rules you put in place, the more onerous it is for your end users if they don't have context for why those rules exist, right? So finding that right balance and having that conversation is gonna be super crucial here for the success of any governance strategy for content or workspaces. Yeah. Okay, next slide, Maggie. Okay, so this is just an out there example of where you can get to if you apply all of the principles that we've been talking about um, with with regards to uh, information life cycles, team life cycles, understanding the stages that information goes through, understanding the folks who work on information at different stages. This is a, essentially an information map that shows, and you can read the stages at the top in red from left to right, that here we're looking at an event-based team. Uh, there is a process of initiation. There's an agenda that gets compiled. There's some marketing that happens for this event. We finish preparation for the event and then this event happens. And then finally we wrap up after the event and then there's a record keeping uh, piece uh, where certain pieces of information from the event go through to uh, the retention system. And below that, we've identified the different stages or tasks that occur in this, this uh, information workflow. And you'll see towards the bottom on the left-hand side that there are different types of information that are being worked on at different stages of this process. So for a team that does event management, this type of resource is invaluable because not only does it allow them to map out their process and to align that information workflow at a granular level to their process that it's highly effective and efficient, but it also spells out the compliance roadmap in such a way that we know that we are being due diligent in terms of how we apply record keeping, that we understand where information is going at different stages of this process. And this applied to your most important information is really a, a, the best way for you to granularly manage your information and ensure that you are managing the liability um, that would be inherent in information that just grows organically from a compliance perspective. Yeah, I really like this, Ryan. This gives a lot of context for how to actually tactically start thinking about these tasks and talking to the business about it or who even to talk to about it, right? Because I think this is something that, that a lot of organizations still struggle with is, am I going too low or too high in this conversation? No, we actually need to talk to all aspects here to really build out a cohesive strategy. And by the way, here are some suggestive tasks to consider as a part of these steps for these different parts of the business. Yeah, exactly. All right, and that ties in naturally to this slide, which has a lot more to do with the one size fits all approach isn't necessarily going to be the best fit for every part of your organization, right? So thinking about this again, tactically, you might have a strategic requirement to hold on to information for seven years, but there might be some exceptions, right? Department A may have a shorter period of time, or maybe for example, doesn't allow any external sharing on their content. So maybe it's subject to different rules or thinking about these different parts of the business and how you want to configure these rights going forward 
forward, right? So what we have in this slide and the emphasis here is don't think a one size fits all imposition is going to work best for the different lines of business that you have. You're going to want to, uh, to try to apply nuance where possible. So when you're thinking about a solution, either software or a business process, think about how you guys can have a general framework but then build exceptions or build different steps in for how the different lines of business operate right and trying to meet them along the way because obviously you know business processes can be flexible if people are shown that they can be done better in a different way so finding different ways to talk to your business about how to control these different aspects the recertification or confirmation of of the purpose of a workspace over its lifetime who has access to it how it's asked for from from a governance standpoint those things can all all be applied specifically and tailored to those parts of the business and how they work yeah I love this because it really speaks to what we're saying uh, from a from a, the perspective of managing your risk and your policies at different levels at different stages of the game That's we spoke right. about right at the outset first identifying the difference between rotten dark data and your 12% business critical, and then understanding the difference between uh, your operational framework and your information governance framework, and then really diving into the individual departments before you get to that individual uh, uh, itemized uh, information life cycle. And so really there's there's uh, different levels of granularity where you can start to manage, manage these things effectively by creating ever increasingly more granular buckets, I suppose. Yeah, definitely. That's And that's the way to think about this, right? It's, and as I alluded to earlier, start with the lines of business that already have these things in mind, and then it will be, yeah. make it infinitely easier for the ones that have less structure by default. Yeah, that's good advice. All right, so then next here, what, what we're intending to uh, help you guys surface is thinking about how to look at different applications you guys support for your business today, right? So thinking about how an intranet portal, for example, plays into you know a user's OneDrive or where people are collaborating on a day-to-day -day basis, all these things at the end of the day tie into a cohesive strategy for records management. Right. So being able to think about these different workspaces and how to apply a metadata strategy, thinking about 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 it, not only as you guys mature from a, on a department to department basis, but an information type as well. So this gets into that really interesting next part of this of this conversation about, well, OK, so we started with these businesses. And you, and you're saying emphasize finance, health care, finance, you know, legal, HR, et cetera, as a part of our focus. But you'll start seeing pretty quickly that there are some commonalities and how these users work on their content, right? So this allows you guys to think about a strategy from a holistic standpoint and how you would want to apply it across the business for all sensitive information, right? Rather than coming in with, with potentially overly complex tags and labels specific to finance, start with things that are just sensitive. This is sensitive information. It's meant for internal, act, internal consumption only. That's a really great place to start to help you guys start controlling these objects. And then from there, you can start sifting and, or, and, and, and filtering for the different lines of business and the different conditions they're going to have for the compliance framework you guys are trying to enforce. Yeah, fantastic. All right, next, go ahead, Ryan. Okay, um, so if what we've been talking about is interesting to you folks who've given us some of your time and, and kindly listened to us banter backwards and forwards, um, and we saw in some of the polls that a lot of folks were saying, I'm not sure I, I have a problem. Uh, and on a slide that Brian was showing us that the first step in this journey for many organizations is a process of understanding where do we really stand? Do we really understand our maturity at different levels of in this, in this very complex information governance ecosystem? Uh, and so if you've enjoyed what we've been talking about, we would like to invite you um, to reach out to us for a workshop that's completely uh, no, it's completely free and no obligation thereafter, uh, where we can extend the services of some of our uh, cloud architects and governance experts to come in and have a discussion with you guys about where you are and perform some small assessments to really give a litmus of where there may be some low-hanging fruits that uh, your compliance team could take advantage of or your IT team could take advantage of, and really just uh, 
let's see if we can uh, assist you in uncovering some of the, the, the pathways that are open to you in exploring some of the things that we've discussed on the webinar today. If y'all are up for q and I do have a question from Kelly. Sure. So Kelly wants to know, what about files for the HR that have to be held up for up to 75 years? Oh, sure. So we, we talk to customers all the time who have very long horizons on the on information, right? So you're, you're going to want to think about the steps there, right? So, so is that information that needs to be immediately accessible once it has been tagged or labeled as a long-term hold? Or can it go into a more stable structure or into long-term storage, for example, just because it needs to be held onto but may not necessarily need to be accessible over, over its lifetime immediately? So just thinking about the who would want to access that content for those 75 years and then thinking about where you would want to put it and most of that information that I've seen with a lot of customers ends up in long-term storage of one form or another because that information will only probably be used after the first few years probably in a lawsuit right and that that information would probably only be valuable at the time of of discovery or as a part part of part of the legal process for when that information needs to be found right so just thinking about uh, that information may not be a may, may not be valuable in a few years but you can keep it in a long-term storage as a part of your strategy and that's something I would definitely want to consider um, any thoughts there Ryan yeah maybe just to paraphrase what I think you're saying I think for those types of records you very rarely want to keep them in SharePoint for instance yes. because we know that that uh, space is at a premium there there are options and and strangely enough some of those are called iceberg storage uh, where yes. it's very very low cost for you to store large amounts of information but it may take you several days to rehydrate that back out and if that's a situation and it probably is for these types of long-term records then that's a really good mix of uh, benefit versus cost for these types of record keeping situations I appreciate that that was a very clear concise <laughs> clarification of what I was trying to get at so I appreciate that Ryan <laughs> Why All right, Kelly. Around, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> Kelly, I hoped that answered your question. So thank you, everybody who who showed out today. We appreciate you coming. And the the recording for this webinar will be out in your inboxes in about 24 hours. So keep an eye out for that. And of course, obviously contact us if you have any questions. If you're interested in the workshop, reach out to me and we'll go ahead and get you scheduled. Thank you so much, everybody, and thank you, Ryan and Brian. Thank, thank you, everybody. You. Have a good day. Bye.